the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, Minister of Foreign Affairs Ali Sabri emphasizes that renegotiating with the IMF is a very serious and unsuccessful endeavor, stating that resuming negotiations with the IMF could jeopardize the next tranche due in December. The Department of Immigration and Emigration implements a temporary policy to issue a maximum of 750 passports per day, strictly on a first-come, first-served basis, until a long-term solution is established. The Colombo stock market experiences six straight days of losses, with the latest session further extending the downward trend. And prior to Canada's announcement this week of 100% duty on Chinese-made electric vehicles, Tesla requests Ottawa to consider a reduced tariff on its cars. From Studio 24, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Minister of Foreign Affairs and Justice, Prison Affairs and Constitutional Reform, President's Council Ali Sabri, emphasized that renegotiating with the International Monetary Fund is a very serious and unsuccessful endeavor. The minister highlighted that resuming negotiations with the IMF could jeopardize the next tranche due in December. It's a very, very serious process. I started the initial negotiation, President, then President, uh, Gotabe Rajapaksha officially communicated the desire to apply for an extended farm facility in March 2022. By the time we get the first tranche was March 2023. It took one year for us to agree on the DSA. So DSA has five parameters. 133% of the current uh, debt should be reduced to 95%. Hmm? On, the, on, on the DSA. <laughs> then 9.3% of the current payment of the GDP which is going for foreign uh, loan settlement has to be brought down to 4.5%. Then there has to be a 2.1% surplus on the primary balance. 15% of the uh, tax should be revenue or, or rev revenue out of GDP. Now you can't just change this. This become a part of the law. If you try to renegotiate and change it, it will take another one year. If that happens, IMF will not give their next tranche of 400 million in December. If they don't give, the World Bank will not give their next tranche of 400 million. And if they don't give, ADB will not give their next tranche of 500 million. So about 1.2 to 1.3 billion is in danger from December to January. Without that, the rupee will tumble, inflation will go up, and country will be unstable. The Department of Immigration and Emigration has implemented a temporary policy to issue a maximum of 750 passports per day, strictly on a first-come, first-served basis, until a long-term solution is established. This measure has been introduced due to the current shortage of blank passports available in the department. The limitation is intended to manage the limited passport supply more effectively and to ensure that each applicant receives their passport in a fair and orderly manner. The department is actively working on resolving the supply issues and developing a sustainable approach to meet the ongoing demand for passports. This temporary restriction will remain in place until the necessary resources are secured and a permanent solution is achieved. Also, Foreign Minister Ali Sabri told reporters at a media briefing in Colombia yesterday that there is a deficiency and that he apologizes on behalf of the government. He stated that it happened because they have migrated to a new electronic passport system and according to the order they placed, they will get the new passports on the 16th of October. He further added that until then the country will have to manage with what is available and he agrees that they could have kept a large number of blank passport books and manage this better. <laughs> The first payment towards implementation of hybrid power projects in three islands of Jaffna has been handed over by the High Commission of India to Sri Lanka, Santos Jha to the Secretary of Minister of Power and Energy, Dr. Sulakshana Jaiwardhana, and Chairman of Sri Lanka Sustainable Energy Authority, Mr. Ranjit Sepala. The handing over of the funding was carried out at a ceremony held at the Indian High Commission in Colombo yesterday. Issuing a statement in this regard, the Indian High Commission in Colombo said a memorandum of 
of Understanding for the Implementation of the Hybrid Renewable Energy Projects in Delft, Nainathu and Analaithu Islands was signed between the Government of the Republic of India and the Government of Sri Lanka in March of 2022. The project, aimed at addressing energy needs of the people of the three islands, which are not connected to the national grid, will combine various forms of energy, including both solar and wind. Port City Colombo has achieved a significant milestone on boarding 100 plus companies as authorized persons as of the 24th of August this year. These companies represent a diverse range of sectors identified to the Colombo Port City Special Economic Zone. These sectors include IT, finance, professional services, shipping, logistics, tourism, healthcare, real estate development, and global capability centers. Among these authorized persons, 22 companies have been designated as businesses of strategic importance. The Colombo Port City Economic Commission is currently reviewing BSI status of the other APs at present. Several companies are in the pipeline to register as APs, reflecting increased investor confidence in the Port City Colombo. These achievements align with the Port City Colombo's vision to attract high-value foreign direct investments, whilst a diverse range of companies reflect the SEZ's focus on service-oriented sectors. These developments are projected to generate a demand of 30,000 to 50,000 square meters of office space in the Port City Colombo. Let's take a short break now. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. The Colombo stock market has faced six consecutive days of losses, with the latest session continuing the downward trend. Both indices displayed negative sentiments, sparking concerns among investors about the ongoing market decline. For further insights, we now turn to Imad Deen from Capital Alliance Securities. Today, the Colombo Stock Exchange concluded on a negative note following yesterday's trend, mainly, mainly due to the high level of selling during the trading session. The market ended at 10,907 points, marking a 37-point decrease from the previous session, with a turnover of 1.04 billion rupees. The SL20 index also experienced a downward movement of 12.12 .12 points to end the day at 3,083.92 points. Notable institutions' engagement was observed across various sectors, with high turnovers and crossings recorded on Sompot Bank and Haley's PLC. The top five gainers for the day were SMB Leasing PLC, Radiant Gems International, UB Finance, Harris Chandra Mills, and Orient Finance PLC. The top five losers for the day were Lee Hedges PLC, Renuka Hotels PLC, Renuka Holdings Non Voting, Ceylon Developments, and Satosa Motors PLC. The Sri Lankan rupee has been on a positive trajectory in recent weeks, but it has recently shown signs of a slight downturn. To gain a deeper understanding of this trend, we hear from Vinodhani Rajapupati at First Capital Holdings. Thank you. In August, the Sri Lankan rupee saw its second month of appreciation rising by 0.6% from July. At the beginning of this month, the exchange rate was LKR 302.4 against the US dollar, but by the third week, it had strengthened to LKR 298.7, dipping below the 300 mark for the first time since May. However, in the final week of the month, the rupee slightly depreciated and closed at LKR 300.7 against the USD today. During the year up to 29th August 2024, the LKR has appreciated by 7.2% against the US dollar. It has also strengthened against other major currencies including, including the Australian dollar, China, Chinese renminbi, euro, sterling pound, Indian rupee and Japanese yen. This positive trend is largely due to a strong external sector performance in the first half of 2024. We saw significant increases in worker remittances and tourism earnings. Remittances were up by 11.4% year-over-year, while tourism earnings surged by 77.9% year-over-year, with tourist arrivals surpassing 1 million compared to around 624,000 in the same period last year. 
Looking ahead, First Capital Research predicts that the LKR will likely stabilize between 295 and 305 against the USD by the end of December 2024. Despite the strong growth in tourism earnings and remittances, Sri Lanka's balance of payment surplus, which was maintained during the first half of 2024, could face challenges starting in the first half of next year. This is due to upcoming foreign debt payments and an economic expansion driven by recovering consumer demand, which is expected to widen the trade deficit and impact the balance of payments negatively. As a result, we might see some pressure on the exchange rate towards the first half of next year, which could lead to a slight depreciation of the rupee with the LKR trading between 305 and 315 against the USD in the first half of 2025. Gold prices rose in Asian trade today, staying close to record highs as a rebound in the dollar cooled ahead of key inflation data that is likely to factor into the outlook for interest rate cuts. Spot gold rose 0.4% to $2,515.76 an ounce, while gold futures expiring in December rose 0.4% to $2,515.91 an ounce. Some safe haven demand also buoyed bullion prices, especially after some underwhelming earnings from market darling NVIDIA Corporation rattled global equity markets. Gold remains close to record highs before inflation. GDP and spot prices were less than 20 $20 away from a record high of $2,532.05 an ounce hit just last week. Oil prices stabilized today following a smaller than anticipated draw in U.S. inventories, raising worries about declining demand. However, the likelihood of ongoing supply disruptions in Libya helped to limit the extent of losses. Brent oil futures for October delivery dipped slightly to $78.62 a barrel, while West Texas Intermediate crude futures held steady at $74.57 a barrel. Crude markets were recovering from two consecutive days of declines having largely undone a recent rebound due to ongoing fears that slowing growth in both the U.S. and China may negatively impact demand in the months ahead. Traders were still pricing in some risk associated with production disruptions in Libya alongside indications of persistent conflict in the Middle East. Amid the recent depreciation, the Sri Lankan rupee held steady against the U.S. dollar at commercial banks today compared to yesterday. According to People's Bank, the buying rate for the U.S. dollar decreased from 295 rupees and 3 cents to 294 rupees and 93 cents, while the selling rate dropped from 305 rupees and 61 cents to 305 rupees and 51 cents. Now we'll review the exchange rates of the rupee against other currencies. A short break now, corporate updates right after this. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Hilton Yala Resort, nestled in the heart of Sri Lanka's renowned Yala National Park, celebrates its first anniversary on the 31st of August. In commemoration of this milestone and in alignment with its ongoing commitment to environmental stewardship and community engagement, the resort is rolling out a series of activities. These activities are aimed at improving public amenities at two iconic locations within the Yala National Park. Patanangala, a scenic rock outcrop along the Yala coastline, and Paranathotopola, a popular camping site, are named as the two iconic locations. These efforts will focus on improving cleanliness, functionality and the overall visit experience, ensuring that these natural attractions remain pristine for both local residents and international visitors. Guests can craft their own pottery pieces through traditional pottery techniques guided by the property's master potter on the 31st of August. 
The anniversary exclusive session is suitable for all skill levels and offers a relaxing and educational glimpse into the region's cultural heritage. The resort will also offer an interactive wildlife session with its park rangers on the day where guests can learn about local wildlife, including snake species native to the region. Hilton Yal Resort also takes this opportunity to recognize the achievements of its dedicated team members. The resort's team members have been instrumental in delivering exceptional service and have been recognized in various industry competitions. Sri Lanka's LTL Holdings is planning to raise up to 20 billion rupees, subject to regulatory approvals in what could be the largest initial public offering in the Colombo Stock Exchange. LTL Holdings is an affiliate of Ceylon Electricity Board, which originally made transformers but expanded into the independent power generation business after the original foreign investors in the firm extended in a management buyout. The firm plans to sell approximately 22% of its shares in its upcoming initial public offering, aiming to raise 16 billion rupees, with an additional 4 billion rupees expected from the green shoe option. The Colombo Stock Exchange announced that the issue will be open on the 10th of September, with shares priced at 14 rupees and 50 cents each. The initial offering will include 1,103,448,300 ordinary shares, with an option to sell an additional 275,862,100 shares. Approximately 14 billion rupees will be allocated to fund the part of equity for a new 350 megawatt combined cycle power plant named Sahas Dhanavi, which is managed by the subsidiary Lak Dhanavi Limited, 82% owned by LTL Holdings, including its O&M contracts. Additionally, 5.5 billion rupees will be invested in a 100 megawatt renewable energy plant to be developed in collaboration with Sri Lanka's WinForce. Yesterday, the 220 megawatt gas turbine component of another 350 megawatt power plant was successfully commissioned. AIA Sri Lanka, one of Sri Lanka's top most respected insurers, has achieved a historic feat at the prestigious Hashtag Asia Awards 2024. The company's long-standing life-saving project, the Poson Safety Program campaign, not only secured a coveted finalist spot in the highly competitive Best Integrated Social Media Campaign category, but also emerged victorious as the silver winner in the Best Social Media Campaign Facebook category. This remarkable Remarkable accomplishment marks the first time a Sri Lankan brand has reached the finalist stage and secured an award at the Hashtag Asia Awards, solidifying AIA Sri Lanka's position as a leader in innovative social media marketing within the region. The Hashtag Asia Awards, renowned for their rigor and esteemed judging panel, attract submissions from across Asia, Australia and New Zealand. This year, over 250 entries from some of the region's most prominent brands vied for recognition. Consolidating its reputation as a celebrated pioneer in sustainable textiles, Haley's Fabric PLC is now among an exclusive group of renowned global businesses featured as case studies in the Global Organic Textile Standard website. This distinction marks Haley's Fabrics as the first and only Sri Lankan company to be showcased on the prestigious global certification platform following its recent triumph at the International Quality Awards 2024, where it clinched the Sustainability Impact Award. The rigorous third-party certification process assures consumers that strict global organic textile standard requirements are met, empowering them to make informed choices that contribute to the growth of the global organic textile market. Halic Fabric PLC now produces over 3 million meters of fabric per month and boasts an annual turnover of $72 million. The GOTS is the world's leading processing standard for organic textiles and fabrics, requiring manufacturers to use at least 70% certified organic fibers with products labelled organic needing 95% of organic fibers. This certification mandates stringent regulations on toxic and harmful chemicals, ensuring that all chemical inputs meet high environmental and toxicology standards. The Palo Alto branch of Sita Holdings, a notable branch among the 86 branches of the Sita Group, a leading business entity founded with its focus around the city of Kandy, has reopened after extensive renovations. The grand reopening event was a significant occasion marked by the presence of several dignitaries and notable personalities. The ceremony was held under the auspices of Managing Director of the Sita Group, Mr. Lakshman Pemachandra, who extended a warm invitation to key figures from various sectors. 
among the esteemed guests were the honorable chairman of the house in development authority mr rajiv surya rachi who played a pivotal role in the event and a prominent businessman mr pradeep premachandra who brought him with the wealthy of the industry insights the newly renovated showroom has been designed to provide a superior shopping experience offering a wide range of products from world renowned brands in addition to the enhanced shopping environment the sita group has introduced several promotional offers to celebrate the reopening Customers visiting the new showroom can enjoy exclusive discounts and special deals creating an opportunity for them to save on high quality products. Let's take a short commercial break. Global updates coming on the other side. This is the nightly business report. Welcome back to the nightly business report. Asian stocks retreated today, pressured chiefly by losses in the technology sector, following underwhelming guidance from market darling Nvidia. Although expectations of lower interest rates helped limit overall losses, declines in the tech sector were also relatively muted, given that Nvidia Corporation still beat expectations with its quarterly earnings. Analysts were seen maintaining a bullish stance on the firm. Tech-heavy Asian bosses were the worst performers of the day, with South Korea's Kospi. Hong Kong's Hang Seng and the Taiwan Weighted Index losing around 0.8% each. Tech losses were weighed largely towards chip makers, especially those with direct exposure to Nvidia, which fell as much as 8.5% in aftermarket trade. All three major US stock indexes closed lower with tech weaknesses weighing heaviest on the Nasdaq which fell over 1%. Nvidia's shares dropped in expanded trading after its quarterly forecast missed investors' lofty expectations. US stocks fell on Wednesday ahead of a quarterly earnings report from AI darling Nvidia after the closing bell, Wall Street's centerpiece event of the week. The Dow shed four-tenths of a percent, the S&P 500 lost six-tenths, and the Nasdaq dropped more than one percent. NVIDIA forecast third-quarter revenue largely in line with Wall Street's estimates. But after several blowout quarters, Wednesday's report failed to impress, with NVIDIA's stock, which closed down 2 percent, falling more than 5 percent in extended trading. Other chip stocks also dipped, with Broadcom and Advanced Micro Devices each losing ground. And fellow Magnificent Seven members Alphabet, Microsoft, and Amazon dipped lower as well. But the biggest tech tumble by far came from Super Microcomputer, whose shares plunged 19 percent after the AI server maker said it would delay the filing of its annual report a day after Hindenburg Research disclosed a short position in the company. In notable non-tech news, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway briefly passed $1 trillion in market value for the first time ever. Before Canada said this week it was imposing a 100% duty on Chinese-made electric vehicles, Tesla approached Ottawa and asked for a lower tariff on its autos. On Monday, Canada announced it would impose tariffs on all Chinese-made vehicles sold in the country, mirroring the U.S. move, due to what it described as China's deliberate, state-driven policy of overproduction. Canada said this week it was imposing a 100% tariff on EVs imported from China including vehicles made there by Tesla. But Elon Musk's firm had approached Ottawa ahead of the announcement, seeking a lower rate. The company reportedly wanted something similar to its deal in the EU, where it faces a tariff of just 9%. That compares with rates of up to around 36% for other Chinese EV imports. The source says the EU calculated its rate looking only at direct subsidy costs whereas the U.S. and Canada have included other factors including environmental and labor standards. Washington in May said it was quadrupling its duties to 100 percent following the assessment. Now the Canadian levies will kick in from October. There was no immediate comment on the report from Ottawa or Tesla. The company doesn't disclose its Chinese exports to Canada. 
But analysis shows it ships Model 3 sedans and Model Y crossovers to the country from its Shanghai plant. Other brands that ship from China, including Volvo and Polestar, have said they are assessing the impact of the tariffs. And with that, we mark the end of tonight's bulletin. We'll see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the business globe. Until then, I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.